Good morning, good morning. Phil Davis, Ancestry Lands, AncestryLands.com. Folks, we're going to have a, well, we're about to get on the actual highway here, the famous merging lane here. Here we go. Uh, down the street from this location is Villanova University. I want to say maybe uh, it's about maybe a thousand feet straight down the road. And I've had the privilege of living in an affluent area uh, for these last five years and many years, actually. I grew up in affluent areas. Um, I did spend some time living in some less affluent areas throughout my life. So it gave me some experience to notice the difference that the only difference between a person who has less wealth than another person is pretty much their debt. It's not always their income because someone can be in more debt. Now, see what's happening here. A car is behind me. He slowed down. I'm going to speed up and get over. Even though there's enough room, you can see here in this middle lane for him to get his ass over because he's coming into a merging lane. You'll see behind me, there's, I was able to get over very easily. It's always an issue with this merging lane. People staying in the right lane, you have an, in, an oncoming ramp. People entering the highway. This is like every time, but okay. When I say about less affluent areas versus affluent areas... It really boils down to your debt, how much debt you're in and what you owe. A person who makes less money and does not live in the same affluence, meaning wealth or richer area, for most people who don't understand the terminology of affluence, they don't drive a Benz, they drive a regular Honda Accord, the items do not create value. The home does not create value if a person is in more debt and is going to be foreclosed on a home. You might be renting in an apartment and think that, man, you know, you see people's lives, other people's lives, and you're saying, man, this guy has a nice car, he's got the look, he's a doctor, and I'm telling you, a lot of times when I work with doctors, when I ask them about their families, their children, when I find out that, they're a lot of, and I'm not shooting down doctors at all, but it's just an example of these people are out saving lives in the world. They're changing the world and they're keeping people alive that normally would not be able to make it at this point. And one of the things that is a contradiction to that, they're saving lives, but they're not, the value's not there for their own children's lives. You know, they're chasing out the wealth, status, prestige, things of that nature. But at the same time, their children are being left behind. Their children have problems and issues that typically their wives only have to you know, they have to be able to ones to manage them. You know, the doctors are very busy being on call, working long hours or going through multiple locations. And every problem typically that they deal with is going to be something in the nature of an emergency or life and death in some cases. And it's, it's a shame because you would think a doctor's, their kids would be, you know, right at the top. But a lot of doctors, I see their kids, you know, they have delays or speech impediments or, you know, autism, they have things wrong with them. And a lot of times their focus, their majority of their time is spent still in their, their, their profession, their craft. And I have a thing against these so-called delays, you know, like with my son, he just turned two and he says a lot of words, his speech is increased. But when you go to these doctors, the pediatricians, sometimes it's like, well, does your kid you know, do exactly this. And I'm like, damn, he just turned two, two days ago. I mean, it's literally three days into being two, three days. And every child grows differently. You all learn differently. Every person has a different journey in life. And you might not be like for me, I'm a very hands-on person. So like when I say I could be a surgeon, if you show me a surgery five times and I'm able to do it, Look at this guy right here. You're going to get over and there's an oncoming merge lane. You don't need to get over. Stay in your lane. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, you're going to get over. Now he's going to get over. Of course, you know. All right. Now he's right up on someone's ass. Look at this. Because he wants to get ahead of the truck on the left. And more than likely, all you had to do was stay. He's probably going to get past, you know, in the, lane, in the left lane, which is what I'm going to do. And I'm more than likely going to pass him. What a jackass, man. 
So, you know, and, and, and again, now there's a difference between children who actually have real disorders and children who have delays. A delay is not a disorder. A delay means like you're, you're not doing it at what the average kid does. But again, everybody, every child develops differently. Every person, your journey is going to be different. So sometimes you may not get to wealth until you're 70 as opposed to another person gets to wealth in their 20s. There's a whole list of factors that contribute to that. The same way, you know, I look at my three kids. My daughter started walking at like 13, 14 months. She could talk, she could write, she could spell, she could read, but she was not walking at all. My other two sons walked at like eight, nine, 10 months. I mean, like, you know, one night we're working on it. Second night we're working on it. These guys are up walking around. I mean, like full on walking. So a lot of times they're different. And you got this world now that says that everyone needs to be at the same marker, same milestone, but we each have different gifts. We have different specialties. Like I said, with me, I'm a very visual learner. I want to be hands on. You show me something. I watch it three or four times and I'm like, okay, I can do. So even as a nurse, I was more of a, when you show me something, I can replicate that process over and over again to a level of perfection that someone who can read it can conceptually understand and then perform. But sometimes people who are the best students are not always the best performers. When I say performers, I mean that these are not the people who are good at the clinical side, the action side of doing a surgery or doing a procedure or doing an IV or something like that. My, my son wasn't best at like he had learning his colors. He didn't learn his colors through, um, you know, sit down and look at green and say green. What I had to do was I had to put these little like, you know, like maybe not crayons, but these little like, you know, mats, color mats, and I would make him do relay races and say, hey, go get the green one, go get the red one, go get the purple one, go get the brown one. And that really helped him to understand and learn his colors because he needed more of a hands-on approach to understand and learn his colors. You see this jackass right here on the right, he's behind this car and I'm getting right past him because the left lane is going to speed up and the truck eventually is going to get over. You just got to be patient and wait. That's the theme of this one. Sometimes in life, you have to be patient and wait. And I say that because a lot of times we get frustrated with processes taking time when they need to just play out. My daughter at 13 months, we were concerned she's not walking. Most kids are walking at at least a year old. She was cruising, you know, holding on to stuff and getting around, but she would never take a step out there. And then one day she just got up and started walking like 13, 14 months. She was up and walking. The boys were like, you know, it took me, it, my son, Philip, we did it one time. I'll never forget. It was on my brother's birthday. He was, I believe, nine months old at that time because his birthday is in April. So I want to April. Yes, it was like, 10, OK, 10 months old. then. Um, and I remember it was my brother's birthday. We were just sitting there and I said, let me get this thing. How I did sat on the floor and he my wife held him up at the opposite end of the living room. And I just held something up that he wanted. And I said, come and get it. We stood him up, took a few steps, made it halfway, fell, you know, fell. And then we did it again. And then he made it the whole way. Got it on film. It's a little grainy, but he made it the whole way. And after that, it seemed like he just started walking. You know, there was really no more. He Like the concept of walking was there. Now we had to watch him closely. And I just say that in life as an example. I, I did the same thing with my other son. It was like four or five days and he started walking. You know, we're doing potty training with my son five days in. And he's getting the concept of using the potty more. But again, it, it's, it's, it's supposed to be transitional. It takes them six months to get that brain connected to their bladder so they know, hey, you know what? I, I got to hold it and then I got to go. They only spent the last two years, you know, with no control. And sometimes we expect everything to happen in the, the minute that, it, that we're doing it. And that's not life. Some people will take longer to own a home than people who've had a home, two, three, four homes. Now, unless you own two, three, four homes at a time, you own a home now and, and I'm 60 and I own a home now. No, it doesn't matter how many homes you've owned. It only matters if you own a home now. But you got people who own homes that are house poor, meaning that 
all their income goes towards their mortgage. And I've told stories about this before, about my, my over the summertime at my son's baseball camp, that one kid, he needed a new bat. The aluminum bat was, was dented. He needed another bat. And he, the coach told him, hey, go get it. You need another bat. Tell your parents you need another bat. He said, I have talked to my parents about it before. And they said that we cannot get a bat, a fucking baseball bat, because we just bought this house. I mean, the kids in baseball, and, and, and because they have a home, because they have what is considered a marker of wealth, the kid lives his life. The house now becomes the, the child, the investment, and it's not the child. That's what I'm saying. We're putting money into investing in things that really are not the things that are most important. You know, we got to get a home. We got to get this. But we don't have enough money for the families that we that we have, that we sign on to being. And the children didn't sign on to, oh, I, I needed a home as a requirement. There is nowhere that says that you need a house, a house in order to raise a family. Our society puts that pressure on us. You know, in my neighborhood, everybody's got to have a brand new car, the Teslas, the Cybertrucks. They're doing that. But again, when I look at this and I see those examples of children who do not have their parents invested in their lives, they're not rich in a lot of different ways. When they have, uh, you know, issues, behavioral issues, they're, they're not the same as people who are home with their children and have less stuff. We're going after the things that society tells us is most important, and we forget the things that are really important, the things that are fleeting, like the moments we have with our children, working with our children, investing in our children, spending time with our children. And honestly, that's some of the same reasons why we are fucked up as adults. You, know, you look at the previous generation that had parents that, you know, beat them. When I say beat them, I'm not talking about a basic spanking. I'm talking about parents that, you know, beat them because they were the they were the parents like my grandparents were the first generation from their parents being like you know previous slaves i mean my grandma was born in 1931 and uh i'm sorry 1930 34 so you know again her grandfather was a freed slave more than likely i mean 1865 i mean it's only a few generations back that people were enslaved still so what I'm saying is that, you know, again, the generations, you had families now, you know, even my parents, they had the commercial. Do you know where your children are? It's 10 o'clock because the parents weren't home like most of the people think they are. And now there's a value. People understand the value, especially after the pandemic, man, of being around your children. You know, I'm going to tell you a little dirty secret about the medical industry, man. Not every doctor is a great doctor. There are doctors that most nurses they would never want to be a patient of in every field, in every place that you are. And we will never tell you that. We'll never tell you which doctor you want to have. There are doctors I would entrust my life with in a, in a critical decision, even if it's not their specialty. There are nephrologists, the kidney doctors, that I would trust my life with to save me if I had a cardiac problem, a heart problem, better than I would a cardiologist, an actual heart doctor. And, and there are many different doctors that you would trade out for to make a decision if you needed it because they are actually good practitioners. So I, I know it seems like we're going all over the place, but I'm trying to make the correlation that, again, everybody walks and runs at different parts of their lives. And some people do not have the same journey. You cannot compare yourself and feel that you're a failure because you're not at where the next person is. You're not your child is not at where the next child is. Because, again, we see a lot of people go, you know, they, they were the best football player in high school and then they go to college and then they quit the team because they're, a, they're amongst different levels of competition. Anybody who's played sport know that everybody was the star athlete of their high school. But when they get to college and that competition starts to change up, the cream rises to the top. And you see a lot of people start quitting them sports and deciding they want to go somewhere else or they'll go to another school. They want to transfer out because they can't hack when the real competition comes. You were the best amongst the average people. And then when you got amongst people who could play at or above your skill level, eh, now it's a different story. Now you got to compete. It's easy to run touchdowns against all the bum, you know, average teams that they're average kids, not 
going to be off in the top tier schools, but then you get amongst those teams and you start getting shut down. And I say that all because you're looking at your life and comparing it to people who have a different journey, a different road, a different race they're running. And I tell you that all the time, run your race, not everyone else's. I live in an apartment, but I'm not hurting for money. I'm not hurting at all. In fact, I've lent people money as a lender, a private lender. I've got investments everywhere. And the reason why I do that is because I'm not going to overspend. And that's what I'm saying to you. Do not overspend. Don't overextend yourself because you're looking at, well, I got to get a house. My parents want me to get a house. Man, fuck your parents, man. You, they're not the ones that are going to be there when the shit goes down. When your wife leaves you, they're not going to be the ones that are there picking up the pieces of your lives now or giving you a down payment. Now, if they are, that's a different story. If they got some skin in the game in your life and they're going to pick up the pieces and be there, then again, that's it. But a lot of people are heavy on advice, low on involvement. Heavy on criticism, but low on constructive building with you in life. They're not going to do that. They're going to sit there and tell you what to do. Sit back and watch whether you can do it and survive or not. And then they're going to talk shit about you, whether you do it or not. So you should be able to do it at your own pace. I'm not saying disrespect your parents, but I'm saying when they're pushing you to do something that you can look at the math and say, this ain't right. And they want it. Who do they want it for you or themselves? Because they think that, yeah, but they're not willing to put skin in the game and make that investment into your life. It's not the same when your life's on the line and you're on the hook and you have to pay the price. It's easy to tell somebody what to do when you don't have to deal with the fallout from that. It's easy to talk about someone who has to make a decision that you don't have to make and you can sit back and judge. It's easy to, for me to tell a, a person that's overweight to lose weight when I work out. It's easy. But I never had to do it and I was 300 pounds. I didn't have to have that motivation. And I'm saying to you again, run your own race. Understand that success takes time. Your journey takes time. You're not delayed. You're not behind. What you are is at a different level, at a different stage, that if you want to get where someone else is, you're going to have to do things to propel yourself forward. Yeah, you got divorced. Yeah, you're a single parent. Maybe you don't see your kids. Maybe you don't have, maybe you're broke from alimony. You just have a different journey, your different requirements for what you need to do in order to make sure that you can get to the same level where other people are at. That's, that's what's happening. That's what you have to do. You have to find out ways and means of making sure that you can catapult yourself and get yourself to the same level that the other people are at a different um, point in the race. You know, if you're running, you see track in the Olympics when we had the Olympics, right? When you're running track, everybody's running at full speed. The only way to catch someone faster than you is to run faster. That's it. That's the only way to catch up to someone that you feel like you're behind to. You have to generate more speed. You do that by making better financial decisions. You do that by not increasing more debt. You do that by addressing the problems, doing the work, taking inventory like I've talked about before. And you can't look at every 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 comparison as you're not doing as well because you don't have X, Y, and Z. Life's not a checkoff. Life is a growth process. And during that growth, sometimes you have to re- you sometimes you have to regress to grow. Sometimes you got to go back a step to move forward. It happens in life. I mean, when you think about it, all these trees here in a few months on these drives, you will see all these trees go back to no leaves. They will be barren. It will be cold. They will have to go back into a regressive state in order to grow again. That is life. So I say that and I'm charged again, let life take time. Take, give yourself time to grow. Give yourself time to become successful. Give yourself time to be, to work things out, but you need time to focus on the things that you need to do in order to change the outcomes and make them well, Let me say that again. You need time and you need to spend that time investing in the things that can be productive enough to give you the outcomes you're looking for. That's much better said. And again, run your race and give yourself time. Give yourself grace. Give yourself enough time 
to grow. Give your children enough time to learn. They're going to make mistakes. Give them time. I'm not saying do not discipline them. I'm not saying do not reprimand them, but give them time to grow. They are growing at their own pace and they have to overcome their own biology, their own basics, their own hurdles, not just the hurdles from your judgment of what you think. And the one thing you could do is be supportive and, and look at what they do well instead of focusing on always what they're not doing or what they need to do more of. As if they're not already aware of that as is. That's all I have to say for today, folks. I'm a little charged this morning. And I, I just constantly, you're, you're always put up against a, did you, are you doing this? Are you doing that? You know, Michael Jordan had, you know, 50 points. How come like, you ain't had 50 points? It, Again, man, you know, that that's not everybody can't be a Michael Jordan. So I say to you folks, love yourself, give yourself enough time, give your children enough time to grow. Give yourself enough time to get where you're going to get and spend that time wisely doing the things that can get you the outcomes you need in life. And don't take corners. Stop cutting corners. Phil Davis, Ancestry Lands, AncestryLands.com. I hope you've been educated, inspired, and somewhat entertained. The link to my website, Ancestry Lands, is in the description section below, along with my book, Getting Dollars from Dirt, A Beginner's Guide to Vacant Land Investing. It is in the description section below. It's on Amazon. Please show your support by getting a book, not because you're just supporting me. You're supporting yourself and you're gaining knowledge. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Like, share, and subscribe. Peace. Have you ever wondered how some individuals amass wealth through vacant land investments? Here's your answer. We introduce the perfect solution. Getting Dollars from Dirt, A Beginner's Guide to Vacant Land Investments, written by author Philip Davis Jr. and also owner of Ancestry Lands. Uncover tried and true strategies and expert advice to navigate vacant land investments, even as a novice. This book simplifies the process, offering practical steps toward financial independence. Learn to spot lucrative opportunities and boost your returns. Getting Dollars from Dirt equips you with the confidence and knowledge for wise investment decisions. Seize this incredible opportunity. Get your copy now and embark on your journey to wealth. Click the link below to order. Start building your fortune today.